Welcome to session 11 of our Bible survey course. Uh, we are dealing today with um, the post-exilic literature. That is the literature that was either written or developed or compiled after the Babylonian exile, which ended in 539 BC. Um, and um, I, I'm hoping that you will be uh, giving me the opportunity to interact with you as you uh, go through these videos. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, uh, especially since I can't uh, lead these sessions in person. I would love to get some uh, feedback from you, some questions, comments, um, as we move through this uh, material together, or at least just let me know you're out there and let me know that you're tracking with me. My name is Stephen Clyborne. I'm the senior pastor at Earl Street Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, if you would like to follow along today's session, you can find the outline on pages 27 and 28 of the study guide that I've prepared for you. And the study guide can be found on our website, esbcgreenville.org. Um, you click on the resources tab and then the Bible survey tab and, and you can find the study guide. And you can also find the, the other videos in this series um, as well. Today, we're going to be talking about the literature that really developed after the historical period covered in the Old Testament. The period from the end of Nehemiah's governorship, which would be somewhere, as you recall, there's some dispute about the date of Ezra and Nehemiah, but somewhere around 440 BC or in that neighborhood until the Maccabean revolt, which was in the second century BC, a lot of literature developed during that period of time over a period of about 200 years, which during this uh, period of time reached the form in which we now know it. Um, the, the first of these um, books that we're going to look at is the, is the book of Obadiah, which is really nothing more than just a hymn or a poem of hate against Edom. We know nothing about the um, author. Um, we, we know that the book is clearly directed against Edom for plucking the bones of the nation of Judah, so to speak. The Edomites were, you might remember, uh, the descendants of Esau. And because there were several incidents of Edomite violence, a precise date cannot be determined with accuracy about exactly which incident the book of Obadiah seems to be addressing, but most scholars seem to think that the incident alluded to in Obadiah followed the destruction of Jerusalem in 587, uh, when the Babylonians, with the help of the Edomites, uh, plundered and devastated and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple there. Uh, the message of the book was basically, basically a pronouncement of God's judgment on Edom. If you look at uh, the prophecy of Obadiah, uh, you see that it's only one chapter. The first 14 verses um, serve as an indictment against the Edomites for their outrageous and hostile actions when their brothers were in peril. Um, and then verses 15 through 18 is an announcement of the day of the Lord's recompense upon the nations. And then verses 19 through 21, a proclamation of the return of Israel's exiles and their dominion over Edom, the day when the tables would turn, so to speak, and the exiled people would be able to return to the land that the Edomites helped to destroy. It's a very brief uh, prophecy. I invite you to, to read it. You can read it in just a few minutes. Uh, the next book is the book of Malachi. Um, in the book of Malachi, the Lord is questioning the community of faith. Um, the, the, uh, the name Malachi literally means my messenger and could be 
so it could be someone's title rather than someone's name, but really nothing is known about the man himself. It's possible that he was a prophet since he was devoted to the temple. He held a very high view of the priesthood, as we'll see, and spoke frequently of the covenant and spoke frequently of the Torah. The prophecy was probably written somewhere between the rebuilding of the temple, um, which started around 520 BC, and the work of Ezra and Nehemiah, which would have been around 440 BC. So a period in that, say, 100-year time period. It was a time when the hopes of the returned exiles had turned bitter. The people had grown cynical. And they were careless in their acts of worship. So the prophet was trying to arouse a disillusioned community that had grown cynical with the continued delay of the glorious future that second Isaiah had, had promised. Um, the, the style of the prophecy is six cycles of dialogue. Malachi gives evidence of being a well-developed literary production. In six sections, the prophecy takes the form of a dialogue in which uh, first, the Lord through the prophet made a statement, and then second, the people or the priests would respond to the Lord's statement with a question, and then third, the Lord through the prophet would answer the question by substantiating his initial statement in more detail. Um, you can kind of look and see how this is developed. Um, if you look at uh, Malachi chapter one, um, beginning with verses two and three, um, the Lord says, I have loved you but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. I have laid waste his hill country and left his in, in, in heritage to jackals of the desert. And then in verses six through eight, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, O priests who despise my name? You say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. And you say, how have we polluted it? By thinking that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sac sacrifice, is that no evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that no evil? Present that to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And then if you look in chapter 3, verses um, uh, 6 through 8, uh, you see another example. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. And then the people respond. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing thee? In your tithes and offerings. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, verse 10 says. Uh, you see how that dialogue takes place. The Lord makes a statement, the people respond, and then the Lord expounds upon his original statement. Um, the prophecy concludes with a promise that the Lord's messenger would be sent before the day of the Lord. And these are the closing words of the Old Testament leading right to the, the, the New Testament and the ministry of John the baptizer. Uh, Malachi says in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, 
Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Behold, I will send you Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And uh, New Testament interpreters uh, uh, view John the Baptist as the Elijah who, who came before the day of the Lord, which came through Jesus Christ. But M Malachi's message in a nutshell was fidelity to the Lord's covenant and his teachings. Um, the next uh, prophecy we're going to look at is um, the prophecy of Joel. Um, the, the name Joel means Yahweh is God. yo -El, Yahweh God. We know that um, he was a son of Pethuel. He seems to have been closely associated with the religious organization, the temple, the priesthood, etc. He emphasized the importance of ritual responsibilities. You see that in chapter 2, verses 15 and following. And in that same passage, you see that he called upon the priest to sanctify a fast and to call a solemn assembly. He recognized that such ritual actions had meaning only when there was a deep transformation within the hearts of people that the ritual actions themselves were empty and hollow. His message may have actually been transmitted through priestly circles, and he was considered a prophet like Haggai and uh, Zechariah. More than likely, Joel was uh, written during the Persian period. And the Persian period would have taken place with the coming of Cyrus of Persia in 539 BC up until the Greek period with Alexander the Great, which would have begun around 333-332 BC. Uh, the reasons why we believe that Joel was written during this time was because chapter 3 verse 2 um, seems to presuppose that the Jews had already been scattered among the nations. Uh, which is a reference to the diaspora, the scattering of the Jewish people. Chapter 3, verse 6, <coughs> excuse me, refers to the Greeks and also implies that the Jews of the, of the diaspora had contact with the foreigners. There's an absence of references to Assyrians or Babylonians, which helps us uh, believe that this prophecy would have been written after that time. And there seems to be heavy borrowing from several other prophets. The whole idea of Yom Yahweh, the day of the Lord, appeared in Isaiah and Amos and Zephaniah. And uh, the, uh, the, the um, prophecy of Joel also kind of presupposes the eternal existence of Yahweh, which is a later theological idea. Um, it also uh, seems to be borrowing from um, Ezekiel's promise of the outpouring of, the, of God's spirit and Isaiah and Micah and Amos' promises of the restoration of the nation Israel. Joel's prophecy is divided into two sections, uh, chapter 1, 1 through 2.27, and this is really the passage for which Joel is most, name, uh, most known when Joel viewed a locust plague which ravished the country as God's judgment on his people and called them to repentance. Um, we don't know whether he was describing a literal um, locust plague or an apocalyptic image of great suffering that was yet to be on the future day of the Lord. So we don't know whether he's talking about a present, past, or future plague. And then chapter 2, verses, verse 28 through chapter 3, verse 21, 
Joel uses the locust plague as a warning and goes on to depict the advent of the Yom Yahweh, the day of the Lord, with its final judgments and um, blessings. In chapter 2, verses 28 through uh, 32, um, he predicts the, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And you may recall that that, that is the passage that Peter actually quoted from in his sermon on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. You can read about that in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. And then in um, Joel chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, you see the picture in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, and, I, and Micah 4, 3 um, is reversed. Um, if I can find that. Um, in, um, this is chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Well, well, verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Um, this is um, uh, the exact opposite of what Isaiah said in 2.4 and Micah said in 4.3 where they said beat your swords into plowshares. Turn your instruments of war into instruments of production. Here that uh, advice is uh, reversed. It looks like the lighting in this video is not good so I'm going to see if I can turn on some overhead light. Not sure if that makes it a lot better. Um, the next section we're going to look at is um, the section known as Second Zechariah. Um, this is the, the section of the prophecy of Zechariah that um, um, most um, scholars believe was written at a later time than the first eight chapters of Zechariah. Uh, the um, author was perhaps a student um, of Zechariah, um, but we think that this that this prophecy came at a later time. It's considered to be the work of someone later than Zechariah, who began prophesying around 520 BC, um, probably in the fourth century. If you look at Zechariah chapter nine, verse thirteen, it says, "For I have built, for I have bent Judah as my bow; I have made Ephraim its arrow." I will brandish your sons, O Zion, over your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Um, so this is um, uh, kind of a reference to a later time than the time of the historical prophet Zechariah. You can see some uh, contrast between the first eight chapters of Zechariah and chapters 9 through 14 which caused scholars to believe it was the work of two um, different individuals at two uh, slightly different time periods. Chapters 1 through 8 um, come from the period between 520 and 518, whereas most of the material in chapters 9 through 14 come from the 4th or 3rd centuries BC. For example, the reference to the Greeks uh, that I just read in 913. Um, is an example of that. Chapters 1 through 8 were written in first person exclusively, whereas chapters 9 through 14 were not written in first person. Chapters 1 through 8 were written in prose, whereas chapters 9 through 14 were written in both poetry and prose. Moreover, chapters 9 through 14 are apocalyptic in style. And then chapters 1 through 8 speak of a political priestly messiah, for example, in chapter 4, whereas uh, chapters 9 through 14 speak of a kingly yet humble messiah, uh, which we see in chapter 9. And of course, the prophecy in Zechariah 9, uh, verses 9 and 10, uh, foreshadow 
uh, the Palm Sunday um, event when Jesus entered Jerusalem uh, just prior to his death. Uh, that passage that says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. Is he humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass? Um, and of course, that prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus, the king, came riding in uh, on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Um, the themes of Second Zechariah are, first of all, the overthrow of the nations of the world, the coming of an ideal king, like uh, the passage I just read, the purification and exaltation of Jerusalem, and the establishment of a new age. Um, and as I mentioned, um, this prophecy was um, quoted uh, on Palm Sunday, and John's description of the crucified Christ in John 1937 reflects a portion of Zechariah 12:10, which says, "And I will pour out the inhabit I will pour out on the house of David and, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of compassion and supplication, so that when they look on him whom they have pierced." They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So Zechariah's prophecy finds expression um, at several points in the New Testament. Then there is the prophecy of Daniel. Um, Daniel um, belongs to a body of literature known as apocalyptic literature. An apocalyptic literature has an elaborate use of symbolism. It comes from a time of persecution and suffering. Apocalyptic literature is world-defying, that is, uh, it is a, a, a foreshadowing of God's promise to eventually correct the injustices of the world. No matter what is going on, God is going to repair, resolve, and reconcile uh, the situation. And it also has elaborate use of numbers. And it is often pseudonymous, which means written in someone else's name. So most uh, Old Testament scholars believe the, the prophecy of Daniel belongs to that uh, body of literature known as apocalyptic literature. We don't really know anything much about the author of we don't really know anything about the author of Daniel. There is some dispute about when uh, Daniel was written. Um, some scholars believe that Daniel was written in the uh, second century. And some scholars uh, believe that it was written in the sixth century. Some reasons for believing that um, that uh, Daniel was written in the second century is that it was included, the book of Daniel was not included in the earlier books that were accepted as scripture, but in the latter group of books of Hebrew scripture known as the writings. So there was the law, the prophets, and the writings. And the writings were the last group of literature that was included as Holy Scripture. So some scholars believe that because Daniel was in that last group, he would not have, uh, the, it the prophecy of Daniel would not have been included among the prophets. Um, the historical interests seem to be more on the second century too, um, more than on those of the sixth century. And the language supports a later date. There are late Aramaic and late Hebrew sections. That is, uh, 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 the style of Aramaic and Hebrew language was a much later version of the language. And there were numerous uh, Persian words um, as well, which indicates that it came after the Persian period. 
and there were at least three Greek words which would indicate that it came after the um, after the Greek period. The theology of the book also seems to reflect ideas um, that were not prevalent until the second century. And apocalyptic literature, as I have described it, did not develop as a literary genre until the second century BC. So that's another reason for believing that Daniel was not written until the second century BC. But there are scholars who believe that um, Daniel was written in the sixth century. First of all, the tradition itself, that it was written in the sixth century is an older tradition. And the, certainly the internal evidence of the book reflects a sixth century setting. There are also some similarities with other Old Testament prophecies like Zechariah. And there were miraculous prophetic visions that explain, uh, I mean, some, some scholars who believe that Zechariah was written in the sixth century would, would, uh, would say that, that the prophetic material in Daniel was, Daniel was miraculous. That is that it was revealed to him in the sixth century about events that would not happen until the second century. Um, and, and then they would uh, debate about the late inclusion into the canon by saying that uh, it was just included among the last group of writings just because it was late being accepted, but not because it was late being written. The content of the book has six stories and four apocalyptic visions. Um, the, the stories for which it is most famous um, is the story of Daniel uh, and his friends in chapter one. You remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter two, uh, the story of the three youth in the fiery furnace in chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar's madness in chapter four, uh, Belshazzar's feast in chapter five, and then uh, perhaps the most famous of all the stories, Daniel in the lion's den in chapter six. But there were more than just stories in Daniel. There were these apocalyptic visions that many people even today take to be uh, prophetic passages that um, still um, uh, uh, foreshadow um, the end of the world. And so there are modern day uh, interpreters who look at these passages and look for signs of the coming of the end of the age along with the signs in the book of the Revelation. For example, in chapter seven, uh, there's the vision of the four beasts. In chapter eight, the vision of the ram and the he goat. In chapter nine, the prophecy of the 70 weeks chapters 10 through 12, the vision of the last days. Um, the messages of the book uh, from the stories is that the Lord shows favor to those who are obedient and faithful to the Torah. Daniel uh, refused to, uh, to cave in to the demands of the king and the Lord protected him. And then the messages from the four visions the message from the four visions was that um, God would intervene in history and establish his kingdom in his time. Arrogant kingdoms come and go, but they would be destroyed in God's own good time. And only God's kingdom can expect to triumph. Well, the people of God struggled for an identity during this period of time um, because so much had been uh, taken away from them and they were having to rebuild <clears throat> their nation and recover a sense of purpose and direction through their long history. But never did that struggle become as pronounced as it did during the period of time after the exile and before the New Testament period. And the struggle, the essential struggle was the struggle between particularism on the one hand and universalism on the other. The particularist, 
the particularist view was espoused by Ezra and Nehemiah. And they are the ones, as you might remember from last session or two sessions ago, who encouraged the people to remain a pure race, not to intermarry with other races because that would just introduce um, other religions. They believed and taught that the Lord had called them to be a holy, distinct, separate people. But the universalist view had been espoused by second Isaiah, which had spoken of Israel's responsibility to be a light to all the nations, not to just to live among themselves as God's chosen people. But this view held that God had chosen Israel precisely so that Israel could bring all the nations of the world under the rule of God. Well, both views were important and both views were legitimate and both views were constantly in tension with one another. It was becoming more and more difficult to tread the fine line between those two views. How can a people be a holy people and still be a missionary people? How can a people be in the world without being of the world? The struggle between the two world views is expressed in these three short books in the Old Testament that were um, compiled and accepted as scripture um, during this period, during this later period of time after the exile. First, there is the book of Esther. Um, we do not know who wrote the book. We just know that the setting is during the reign of the Persian king Ahasuerus, uh, who was also known as Xerxes I. And we know that Xerxes I reigned from 486 to 465. Now, the book of Esther almost did not make it into the um, canon uh, for a few reasons. Um, and the main reason is that God is never explicitly even mentioned. Um, this is why a, a later book called The Additions to Esther was added to the Septuagint and included in the Apocrypha. And that is to take this book of Esther and then add this, this section called the additions to Esther to make the book more religious. Um, and there were moral questions um, as well, the means by which Esther even came to the throne and then the murdering of the enemies of the Jews. And there are reasons why Christians seldom use Esther too. <coughs> And that is um, because it's more Jew Jewish than it is even religious or spiritual. And, and the book of Esther was not even found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's no apparent connection with God, no explicit connection with God. And the morality is certainly beneath that of Christ. And so that's the reason why uh, many early Christians did not want to include this book as scripture. The purpose of the book seems to be to explain the significance and the origin of the Feast of Purim, how the Feast of Purim um, developed. The Feast of Purim is a Jewish feast in February commemorating deliverance from Haman's anti-Semitic plot which is described in the book of Esther. The word Purim is the Hebrew word for casting of lots. And you see that that, uh, that word appears in chapter three, verse seven, and chapter nine, verse 24. Well, as the story goes, um, King Ahasuerus became displeased with the queen. And so he deposed her and sought a suitable replacement for her. Esther, a Jewish maiden won the beauty contest and was chosen to be the king's new companion. Her nationality was not known to the king. Now Esther had been reared by her cousin Mordecai, who was an influential Jew himself. 
even after Esther became queen, Mordecai stayed in touch with Esther. Well, the head of the king's court, Haman, convinced the king that it would be in his best interest to issue a decree ordering the extermination of the Jews throughout the entire Persian Empire. Mordecai persuaded Esther to enter into the king's presence unannounced to intercede on behalf of the Jews. And at just the right moment, Esther pointed out that Haman's vicious plan would include her own death. So the king turned violently against Haman and had him hanged. Moreover, the king issued a new decree permitting the Jews to slaughter whomever they chose on the very day which had been appointed for their own destruction. Esther persuaded the king to extend the time to include another day of killing. And at the conclusion of this bloody triumph, the Jews were commanded by Mordecai and Esther to celebrate annually this occasion of their deliverance. Um, the point of the story seems to be that the Jews should look after themselves and protect their own interests. And the Lord will make sure that they are spared and taken care of. Then there is the book of Ruth. Uh, we don't know who wrote the book of Ruth. Uh, we just know that the setting of the story of Ruth was the period of the judges. However, the book itself seems to have been composed sometime after the Babylonian exile. So long after the setting of the story, uh, we believe this book was actually written. The plot of the story is that Naomi, who was a Jew, had been taken by her husband Elimelech to live in Moab during a time of famine in Israel. But her husband Elimelech died in Moab, leaving Naomi with two sons, Malan and Kilian. Eventually, the sons married two Moabite women, Orpha and Ruth. And then the sons died leaving the three widowed women with no one to look after them. So Naomi and then Orpha and Ruth. Um, so those three widowed women, a mother-in-law and two daughters-in-law, go to Israel to be among Naomi's own people. Naomi insisted that Ruth and Orpha return to their homeland of Moab. And Orpha did, but in that famous passage, Ruth pledged her devotion to Naomi and stayed with her in Bethlehem. And this is the passage that's often read at uh, weddings where Ruth said to her mother-in-law, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Even though those are words of, of loyalty from a daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law, those words are certainly applicable to um, to people who are about to be married, pledging that undying loyalty to each other. Well, while they were there in Bethlehem, Ruth met and fell in love with a wealthy landowner who happened to be a relative of Elimelech named Boaz. And Ruth and Boaz were married and became the great grandparents of King David and were in the lineage of Jesus himself. The point of the story seems to be that the Jews could not claim to be an exclusive group of people when the great grandmother of their greatest king <coughs> and um, the foremother of Jesus himself had been a foreigner, a Moabite woman. It's a tender, beautiful story. I uh, hope you'll have time to read it if you haven't already. Um, and then uh, finally, the last uh, book in this uh, section 
is the book of Jonah. Uh, we do not know who actually wrote the book, but we do know that uh, the main character, Jonah, was an actual prophet who prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II, which, as you may recall, took place between 786 and 746 in Israel. He was a, a Galilean prophet. Um, so even though that was the setting and that is when the historical character Jonah lived, um, most Hebrew scholars believe that the book of Jonah was not written until centuries later. But it's a, it's a very dramatic story about the providence of God um, and the determination of God and how human beings make their choices. But even though we have a certain measure of freedom to make our choices, our choices inevitably fold into God's greater plan and purpose. It's a drama really in eight scenes. Uh, the first scene was in chapter one, verses one through three. Jonah was called by God to preach to Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, to go into essentially enemy territory and preach on behalf of God. Well, Jonah went, but he went in the opposite direction. He was not having any of this. He was not about to go and preach to the enemy. So he went toward Tarshish, which is actually in southern Spain, uh, quote unquote, away from the presence of the Lord. I don't know if you've ever tried to get away from the presence of the Lord, but it doesn't work out very well, and it certainly didn't for Jonah. In scene two, verses four through 16, on this ship in the opposite direction of where God had called him, the ship to Tarshish, there was a great storm which threatened the safety of all the passengers. And when it was determined that the storm was occurring because Jonah was fleeing from his God, the other passengers just threw Jonah overboard. They were superstitious. And so in chapter 1, verse 17, we're told that the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. It's not just that there was this fish it happened along at that time but the lord appointed orchestrated this to happen and jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights well then in chapter 2 verse verses 1 through 10 jonah gave thanks to the lord for his help as if he had already received his help he's praying out of the belly of a great fish and and when jonah prayed the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. You see that in chapter two, verse 10. All right, then the Lord in chapter three, verses one through two, repeated almost verbatim his original instructions to Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it. It was almost as if the Lord says, okay, let's try this one more time. Well, in chapter 3, verses 3 through 10, we're told that Jonah this time goes and does as he is told. And much to his dismay, the people of Nineveh believe Jonah's message and repent. And the Lord withheld his judgment from Nineveh. So Jonah goes reluctantly. He preaches as he was told. And the people repent. The enemies of God repent, and the Lord, rather than lashing out at the enemies, um, forgives them and withholds his judgment from Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria. Well, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Jonah got angry with the Lord and asked to die. Um, he got angry that the people responded to his preaching. And then in chapter 4, verses 6 through 11, again, the Lord appointed a plant for Jonah to give him shade while he pouted outside the city in the scorching sun. Of course, the shade pleased Jonah. But then the Lord appointed a worm to attack the plant and cause it to wither. 
And then the Lord appointed the wind and sun to beat upon the head of Jonah, causing him again to wish to die. The Lord rebuked Jonah for his anger, claiming that he was more upset, that Jonah was more upset about that little plant withering than he was about an entire city of people perishing under the judgment of God. This story has some comedic elements to it, but it shows us for sure who is in charge of the storm and the winds and the waves and the fish and the plant and the, the wind and the sun um, and the shade. Jonah went, sometimes the Lord works through us and sometimes the Lord works in spite of us or around us as he did in the case of Jonah. But the message of the book seems to be that God's mercy and salvation extend beyond the chosen race to embrace all of humanity, indeed, even the enemies of God, the Ninevites. Well, uh, some people look at this book as uh, a completely historical story, a literal, factual story which recorded the actual history of a man who lived in the mid eighth century BC. Um, and, you know, there's no external, external evidence outside of the Bible to prove or disprove the historicity of these events. So some people just take this to be as a, a straight up historical story. Other people take this to be, uh, interpret this allegorically now, allegory is a teaching device in which all the characters are symbolic. And so some people interpret this story symbolically and that every element in the story represents something else. And others take it as a, a parable, which is a teaching device used by someone moved by the Spirit of God to make God's truth come alive for the people of the post-exilic period and to succeeding generations. That uh, some people interpret this story to be true, absolutely true in what it teaches us about God, whether it was historically factual or not. It hardly matters whether Jonah was actually swallowed by a fish or not, that what matters under this view is that um, is that uh, 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 is what it what the story teaches us about God. Now, of course, this story was used by Jesus uh, in Matthew twelve, verse forty, and Luke chapter eleven, verse thirty, uh, to prophesy concerning his resurrection on the third day. Uh, Jonah was in the belly of the big fish for three days. Jesus also spoke of the sign of Jonah when people would hear the word of the Lord and repent as the people did in Nineveh. So this story uh, certainly got the attention of Jesus who used it um, to apply to his own uh, resurrection on the third day. Well, next session, we will complete our survey of the Old Testament by talking about that period of time after the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, around 440 BC, up until um, the, the Roman Empire was established in 63 BC. And we will not be looking at any books from the Old Testament itself, but looking at some of, especially some of the historical books of the section of literature known as the Apocrypha, which, which gives us some information about this intertestamental period that the Old Testament or New Testament does not give us. So I hope I will get to see you uh, the next time um, when we come together for our final session of the Old Testament survey. And then we will begin our survey of the New Testament. Let me hear from you. I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.